without further delay, I want to introduce our guest today. Um, this, today we have Miguel Martinez. Martinez. He is a PhD candidate in the Duke Political Science Department and current 2023-2024 Global Justice and Equity Fellow. His research focuses on how Latinos understand race, their standing in the U.S. racial hierarchy system, and how their conceptualization of race influences their political attitudes and behavior broadly. His research question is, what role do racial ideologies play in forming the foundation of racial attitudes and behaviors among Mexican immigrants? Through a comparative lens, Miguel seeks to trace how Mexicans in their home country first become socialized into a racial ideology and how these preconceptions of race are challenged, reinforced, and or transformed when they get socialized in the U.S., Miguel hopes to provide evidence to show that Mexicans are not only victims of discrimination, but that they can also embody racial attitudes and politics that illustrate their anti-black racism. In order to achieve global racial justice, it is imperative to challenge the belief that Mexico and other Latin, Latin American countries exemplify racial democracies. It is this institutional and social belief that has led to racial inequities within the Mexican community and Latinos at large, which results in the marginalization of those who do not fit into this national and social narrative. Please join me in welcoming Miguel. Thank you uh, so much, Erin. Um, you actually already did my presentation, so <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for uh, coming in on this beautiful spring day. Happy spring season. Um, so today I'm going to be uh, talking about my work, uh, specifically titled Theorizing Mexican Immigrant Racial Attitudes Through an Ideological Lens. Uh, and so I'm really excited to share some of this work with you all and uh, just get your thoughts and uh, just questions and how I can make this work uh, even better. Um, I need a clicker. Aaron, is there something I could change the slides with? Okay, um, so before I dive into some of the details of my research, I want to take a moment to elaborate and find a couple words that are going to be prevalent throughout my presentation so we can have some foundational information uh, to help my work uh, be clear. So my work largely revolves around the concept of ideologies and how it impacts Mexican immigrant racial attitudes and political behavior. Uh, so we can all be on the same page, and ideology broadly can be seen as a set of beliefs within a group that influences the way people think, act, and view the world. It is a systemic roadmap where ideas become coherent. They rely on a few basic assumptions about reality that may or may not have a factual basis. These ideas become coherent, and these ideas serve as a seed around which further thought grows. And so there are different types of ideologies that exist in the world. There's religious ones social, economic, and of course, political. And so to really drive this point home, um, we can think about capitalism and what uh, capitalism entails, right, in terms of some of the ideological uh, pillars of capitalism. It often uh, entails, you know, free markets, little to no government intervention versus socialism, where government's a little bit more involved uh, and they seek to have uh, more, you know, provide equal access to resources and opportunities for its uh, population. Um, it also doesn't have to, do, have to deal with politics. It can also be uh, about other ideologies, such as environmentalism, right? So this can simply be people believing, into it, believing in the need to protect the environment, uh, being able to, you know, they're going to do their part in, in <coughs> recycling and eating, being vegan, and all these sort of things. And much of these ideologies are often embedded in our institutions. They're reflected in our laws, the policies that we put forth. Uh, media, our politics, and how we talk about certain things uh, in our everyday discourse. But for me specifically, I, spoke, uh, I specifically focus on racial ideologies. And so racial ideologies are frameworks, frameworks used by actors to explain, justify, or challenge the racial status quo. This can include the beliefs that created and upheld and justified the Jim Crow uh, era about separate but equal or the beliefs surrounding the ideology of racial equality, which can mean different things to different people. It can be used as a toolkit to push for equal treatment and rights for groups of racialized people who have been historically discriminated against, or 
it can also be used as a toolkit to argue for the end of affirmative action because everyone should be treated equal. Now, um, in terms of just the motivation behind uh, my interest in this research and specifically understanding um, Latino political behavior and the racial attitudes, I was primarily motivated at first to really assess how discrimination affects Mexican immigrant um, political behavior. Um, but then I got, ended up switching over to something, at least for me, was more interesting. Um, you know, I, I think uh, doing research on the impact of racial discrimination and xenophobia against Mexican immigrants is incredibly important. Um, but I wanted to take a different take on this. And more specifically, you know, looking at some of these um, headlines of newspapers and news articles, you know, I, it was evident that Latinos broadly, and more specifically Mexicans, often were behaving in ways that, for many at the surface level, seemed surprising. This includes Latinos for Trump. Why? Why would Enrique Tario, as a Cuban, be the leader of a group of far-right fascist organization that spews, spews white supremacist talking points, xenophobia, racism, and hate? And to be honest, I also want to reflect on my own experiences. As a white Mexican-American man, I quickly realized that my experiences as uh, a white Mexican-American vastly differed from those who uh, were racialized and had more prominent phenotypic Mexican features. I want to further understand Mex Mexican racial attitudes and their politics, but needed to begin in Mexico, not only in the U.S., but it was important for me to focus on the understanding of, of the formation of Mexican racial attitudes and politics through a comparative uh, race perspective, focusing on the, on the role of racial ideologies in Mexico and their experiences when they immigrate to the U.S. Now, just to provide some history on... Um, in Mexico in particular, I want to focus on two particularly dominant racial ideologies. And the first one that I focus on in the context of Mexico, it's called uh, Mestizaje. So under the de facto dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz, Mexico's wealth, social, and land inequality worsened dramatically, which spiraled into the Mexican Revolution that occurred between 1910 and 1920. And so under this... Uh, Post-Mexican post Revolution, people were uh, very discontent with the current system of politics. People were just tired of inequality. And so what Mexican elites embarked on was a nation-building process that sought to bolster uh, greater cohesiveness between Mexicans and also create a sense of pride of being Mexican. And this is where Mestizaje came to be uh, a part of the solution. And so, in essence, um, mestizaje literally means racial mixing, this mixing, the mixing of two different groups. And in Mexico, this often meant the mixing of Spanish and indigenous communities. But mestizaje really means more than racial mixing. It sought to convey that everyone was equal, that unlike the U.S. that outlawed miscegenation, Mexico was actually encouraging it. In their eyes, a racially mixed society cannot be racist a notion that still holds strong today. In addition, it is an ideology that purports the idea of the non-existence of blackness and that the national discourse reflects the idea that black people disappeared of Mexican national history because of the mixing that occurred in its, uh, in, throughout the history of Mexico. And so this, has, this ideology in, in particular has dominated and has become really intertwined uh, as part of the identity of Mexico since the early 1900s. Now, I want, uh, so how exactly does an ideology become um, part of the fabric of, of Mexico, uh, Mexico? And I want to mention Jose Vasco Telos. Uh, he was a very influential writer, philosopher, and Mexican political elite. And he wrote this uh, very influential book called La Raza Cosmica, which was published in 1925. Uh, he, wrote, um, he wrote that racial mixing was seen as something positive and thus encouraged. And in his eyes, it created this new super race called mestizos. And in his book, I pulled out this quote that kind of embodies uh, some of his arguments. 
He states, any professor can verify that the groups of children and young people of Scandinavian, Dutch, and English descent from North American universities are much slower, almost clumsy, compared to the mixed race children and young people of the South. And so his influence really expanded uh, into education as well. He became the Minister of Education. And the institutionalization of education broadly helped build out this ideology. Ideology. Schools became centers that fostered a national narrative of mestizaje that helped foster mestizo identity and national pride. And so through his nationalization of Mexican education, it became a means, uh, a means to transmit this idea, idea this uh, ideology, and socialize people into it. It fostered this national narrative and pride in mestizo identity. Now, racial ideologies do not strip people of their agency. People under any particular racial ideology can push back against it, and this is increasingly happening in Mexico. In more recent years, Afro-Mexicans and indigenous communities have brought to light their own experiences of racism and discrimination in a country that purports to have none. And so currently there's uh, 1.3 Mex million Mexicans who claim African uh, ancestry. And you can see that uh, research has shown that Mexicans continue to prefer white skin and European qualities. Skin tone is a strong predictor of perceived discrimination regardless of socioeconomic class. And anti-black and anti-indigenous anti racism is evident. Now, in terms of the other side of the border, and specifically the U.S., the dominant racial ideology I focus on is uh, something that researchers call colorblind racism. Some scholars have argued that since the passage of the Civil Rights Act in the 1960s, when explicit discrimination based on race was outlawed, more subtle forms of racism emerged. One that seeks to firmly portray itself as an egalitarian society where everyone is treated equally and has the same opportunities. This is often marked by four different frames. That includes abstract liberalism, naturalization, cultural racism, and the minimization of racism. And it's marked by disregard of racism of those in power and justifications that point the finger to cultural and social aspects of racialized groups of peoples as an explanation for, their raci for the racial inequities that exist in the U.S. An example of how people explain away the continued segregation of racialized groups can be about uh, school segregation. So schools, some may argue that schools are racially segregated today because like animals, people naturally get together with their own kind. And people often uh, use these colorblind racism frameworks to state that discrimination does occur, but it is not the explanation that shapes the life chances of people of color. And so we often see these frames shape, uh, shape contemporary race talk and these are specific linguistic ways of articulating racial, uh, racial views. Now, um, my overall research question for my research is this. What role do the racial ideologies of mestizaje and colorblindness play in how Mexican immigrants think about race and racism in the U.S., and what are the political implications? So my argument is this. Mestizaje and colorblindness are opposite sides of the same coin. Although the history of both racial ideologies look different, they are both motivated and were founded to perpetuate and uphold a white supremacist racial hierarchical framework. They both seek to push forth a myth that racism no longer exists, but if it does, it's a rare occurrence, and that, all, that we're all one equal nation, in the case of Mexico, we're all mestizos, and in the U.S., we're all American. These ideologies make it extremely difficult to have any serious discourse to recognize and address social and structural racism in both countries. So for Mexicans specifically, coming from a context in which non-racism and non-blackness dominates the very little racial discourse in Mexico, Mexican immigrants, with some caveats, of course, are susceptible to accepting colorblind messages. But why? And I argue, and I'll uh, elaborate on this a little bit further in the presentation, but some Mexicans have not had an incentive to challenge the racial status quo in the U.S. So to speak a little bit about my methods, I largely uh, do qualitative data, 
Uh, I focus on two, uh, two cities, Durham, North Carolina, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And there's uh, a couple of reasons why I chose Durham, Philadelphia. Durham, and more specifically the South, uh, is, the, is at large, is home to the fastest growing number of Latinos in the United States. So I really wanted to interview uh, Mexican immigrants who have like, recently arrived uh, to Durham. And Philadelphia, Philadelphia had a more established Latino community with, a large, with large areas where they have been able to live and build businesses. They also have a similar percentage of, uh, of Latino populations where Latinos make up 14% of the population in Durham and 15% in Philadelphia. My data was collected between fall 2022 and uh, the summer of 2023. And there's two sampling methods that uh, I ended up employing in terms of recruiting participants. I did uh, space sampling, which is essentially certain hard to reach populations um, tend to gather in specific locations certain times. And so it was incredibly important for me to actually just go to the places where uh, Mexican immigrants congregate, do business, socialize. Uh, and the other method was simply uh, a snowball sampling, which is basically I connected with one uh, respond it, and that person will refer me to one or two other people. I had a total of 12 one-on-one to uh, -on -one interviews that lasted one to one and a half hours. And the questionnaire composed of their uh, questions about their experience with Mexico, partisanship, feelings about certain political candidates, and questions that gauge the racial attitudes. And respondents had the, had the option to either take the questionnaire in Spanish or in English. So the first place I ended up going to was the Durham East Green Flea Market, or what we like to call it, call it La Pulga. Uh, it opened in 2008. Uh, there's a large proportion of Latino Mexican folks who work, visit every weekend. Uh, I highly recommend uh, checking it out if you really want some good tacos. Um, and this is up here is, is me with my little recruiting table. Uh, you can't see it, but I got some Dunkin' Donuts on the table, which was not actually... <laughs> a uh, uh, big motivation for people to talk to me, so I should have not done Dunkin' Donuts. Um, but it was actually pretty difficult to actually have people talk to me. Um, it, was, it was an opportunity for self-reflection on positionality, uh, to show up and people were just like kind of interested. I had a couple of people talk to me. They were interested in trying to learn more about uh, my research, but ultimately they were just like, we don't know you. And so what I ended up doing was simply just uh, just talking to, you know, walking around La Pulga and just talking to them like if they're my tios, my, tios, my tios or tias, my aunts or uncles. And that's how I ended up recruiting a lot of folks uh, in my sample. And specifically in South Philadelphia, I did a similar method. Um, specifically, if you've ever been to Philadelphia, South Philadelphia in particular has a large proportion of Latino businesses and a lot of people just living there. And so um, that was my other... Uh, way to actually connect with folks where I was able to just walk into different businesses and just talk to people and um, ask them, you know, hey, you know, I'm doing this, this study. Are you interested in, in, in taking a questionnaire and giving me some of your time? And so one of my arguments that I mentioned before um, was about uh, the not, Mexicans not having an incentive to challenge the status quo. More, specific, more specifically, the incentive uh, to not challenge the racial status quo. And I provide a historical example and one that uh, is contemporary uh, to illustrate this. So in the 1930 uh, census, uh, part of the, U the US census more specifically, it was the first and only time Mexican was a racial category option on the US census. Um, Latino organizations, in particular the League of United Latin American Citizens, LULAC, despite being prideful of their mestizo identity, quickly mobilized to push for the elimination of the category. Now, to give you a little bit more context, there was an influx of uh, Mexicans, uh, Mexican laborers who came into the countries in the 1920s, and the U.S. Census was like, okay, what do we do with these people? How do we categorize them? And, this, uh, and so the result of that was having Mexican as a racial category on the census. But leading Latino organizations at the time really pushed against this. Why? Uh, because in the era of Jim Crow, they were well aware of what it would, be to be, what it would mean to be classified as non-white. 
More specifically, Mexicans were acutely aware that being classified as non-white would institutionalize a marker by which political elites and policies could be created to strip Mexicans from their civil and social rights, just like African Americans. And this is something I, I actually saw in some of my interviews. And so Anita, who is a 45-year-old light-skinned Mexican who owns a business here in Durham, when I asked her uh, whether or not Mexicans and African Americans had a lot in common, she said the following. Hmm, look, I don't have anything against blacks. I just think, I just think they should work harder. They complain too much about racism. I think Mexicans just work harder. I came to this country to work hard, and look, I've been able to have my own business. I'm grateful for the opportunities, and I don't think everyone takes advantage of them. Here, Anita seeks to differentiate, differentiate, differentiate herself from African Americans by pointing to work ethic and dismisses the impact that racism has on the opportunities that are afforded to African Americans. Another uh, theme that, uh, there are two other themes that I, two groups uh, uh, that I found when I was analyzing my interviews. One, there are, uh, there are a group of Mexican immigrants who are more prone to falling into this colorblind framework. And second, a group of Mexicans who I categorize are shocked into a reality, into a reality that does not reflect the perceived realities that these ideologies put forth. Meaning, for the first group, people are spewing, when I was speaking to them, people were spewing points that often reflect one or both racial ideologies in their communication with me. Second, although many of them were, were not aware at times, some Mexicans shared with me experiences that contradict many of the pillars these racial ideologies push forth. Now, in terms of my results, who exactly are the Mexicans who fall into this colorblind uh, framework of understanding uh, race and racism in the U.S. There were often people who had who recalled experiences that reinforced their prior beliefs. And so, what I found that many of my respondents often recalled experiences that they that reinforced their prior beliefs and were reinforced when they immigrated to the U.S. For example, coming back to Anita, I asked her about whether or not there's racism in Mexico, and she says there's no racism racism in Mexico. I mean, there were jokes about people with darker skin, but it was nothing serious. It's always about class discrimination in Mexico. When I asked about her experience in the U.S. as a Mexican, uh, Mexican woman, she stated, you know, I think there's racism, racism against Mexicans in this country, but I don't think it's common. I think people complain too much about it and need to work harder to get ahead. And I think here, Anita, uh, responses here reflects the idea that racism isn't really a big deal in both contexts, both in Mexico and the US, and it reflects this minimization of racism uh, in both contexts. Another example was Fernanda, a 34-year-old researcher in Philadelphia, when asked if she was walking down the street, would people think she's Mexican? And this is what she said. Fernanda said, hmm, I would say no. Compared to my other Mexican friends, people don't ask me where I'm from. When I do tell them I am Mexican, they are surprised. And so what I found, at least these, uh, these themes show, is that people who are falling into this ideology of minimizing uh, racism in this country often recall the experiences that simply reinforce the belief that, you know, it's not really racism in this country or in Mexico. And they often were not perceived as Mexican. And so a lot of my respondents who uh, were lighter skinned specifically um, we're not, really, we're not really questioned about their identity and belonging in this country. So who are the people who were like, okay, there's something wrong going on. My experiences don't match up with what's going on. I don't feel like I belong. Something's going on here. And so what I categorize this, uh, these groups of people is that they experienced some type of external shock in their racial thinking. And one of them was personal repeated discrimination. And I mentioned repeated because I did have some respondents who said, hey, you know, I got, uh, you know, discriminated in this instance, but I think it was just a one-time thing. It's not something that I feel like occurs very often. And so what I argue here is that discrimination disrupts the, the racial status quo 
when asking my respondents about whether or not they believe racism exists in, in, the, in either Mexico or the US, many pointed to their own discriminatory experiences. Roberto, who is uh, another one of my respondents who works as a cook in a restaurant in Philadelphia, who I'll describe as someone with prominent indigenous features and brown skin, shared the following with me about what race and racism is like in Mexico. He lived in the outskirts of the city. Every time I would go into the city shop, the shop owners who I think had lighter skin, they would look at me as if I could not afford the things in there and with suspicion. And when we're talking about his experiences here in the US, he states the following, Mexicans in this country get paid very little. At tops, I can maybe make $20 an hour. Employers don't really want to give us fair living wages to survive. I, like many other Mexicans coming to this country, thought it would be better living here. Another person uh, that I interviewed was Luna, uh, which was, uh, who was an interesting example. Uh, she mentioned the, that the following, uh, the following discriminatory experience. My husband and I, when we first moved to Philadelphia, we had to, had to use the local laundromat. We were chatting in Spanish together when out of nowhere, this man told us to stop speaking Spanish and to go back to our, our country. And what was interesting uh, about Luna's case was that it wasn't, she, she had lighter skin and she acknowledged to me that she felt like overall she has been treated better because she blends into white America because of her lighter skin. And so here she, she acknowledges uh, that her pale skin affords her a shield from discriminatory experiences, uh, but it still happens whenever she speaks Spanish. Another uh, theme that I saw in terms of just kind of like that served as an external shock in, in terms of how people, how Mexican immigrants think about race and their racial thinking is education. And more specifically, among my younger respondents who immigrated a younger age, uh, they often uh, refer to like ethnic studies courses. So Haxiel, a 28-year-old engineer in Durham, stated the following. Um, more specifically, when I asked him, like, okay, how would you know that you know there's racism in this country and in Mexico? Like, what 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 was the impetus for you to to make that that connection? And he ended up saying, I would say that I took classes that helped me understand racism against Mexicans in the past. It also helped me look inward and start questioning why my family were making racially insensitive jokes. And to briefly touch upon it, in terms of just the politics uh, of some of my uh, uh, respondents, uh, I find evidence to support prior work that has found that those who deny the existence of racism are often voting Republican. Coming back to Anita, she told me the following when asked about how she feels about Donald Trump. I like him. I mean, he promotes businesses, businesses and is just better for the economy and for me. I know you may feel worried about me voting for him, but I want my business to, to be better. And what I also found, and which is not uh, surprising, is that many of my respondents mentioned that the reasoning behind uh, immigrating to the U.S. was for better opportunities. They wanted a job to provide for their families and often shared support for candidates or policies that promote job growth. Others were solely focused on working and were not interested at all uh, in politics and had, and had little to no opinions about politics. And so um, many of them, if, they, if there was an external shock and their primary motivation to come to the U.S. was to, for job opportunities, they weren't really interested in politics. They simply want to work, uh, come here, do better, and provide for their families. And to summarize in the takeaways that I want you all to take away from this presentation is that racial ideologies serve as the foundation by which Mexican immigrants talk about race and racism both in Mexico and the U.S. Discriminatory and or, ed and or educational opportunities help Mexicans challenge the racial status quo while for others, their denial of racism in Mexico and U.S. or dismissal or absence of discriminatory experiences help them to be more likely to accept colorblind messaging, which their politics reflect. So yeah, I'll end it right there. So I'm happy to answer any questions, elaborate on any points that you may have. We have plenty of time.
We have people typing online, so Ooh. I'm going to start with the room. Go. Thank you, Miguel. Um, that was wonderful. I have so many questions, but I'll just start with one first, and then maybe if there's time, um, ask another one. Thank you so much for being kind of honest about your limitations or um, sharing that with us. And just wondering how other scholars, I see that you cited a lot of um, people who I'm assuming are in your field in your presentation. So I'm sure you're not the only one who have had these kind of um, issues with uh, getting people to talk candidly uh, about their experiences with this. So just wondering if those scholars, how have they discussed how they've reached out to people and is that kind of within your discipline how to kind of overcome that challenge because I would see that it, it's a, a, a large one yeah yeah thank you thank you Elizabeth for the question um, I think when I first started this I had this political science research hat on where I felt like okay there's a procedural way to actually get respondents that's me showing a place recruiting people, giving them some type of monetary incentive to actually talk to me about these topics. And that ended up being the complete wrong hat to put on. Like, people, it was extremely difficult for people to talk to me. And I just took a step back. I'm like, wait a minute. Like, I, I know my community. This is not really, Dunkin' Donuts is not going to bring people to the table. And so what I ended up doing, again, was just simply talking to people. I, I had no uh, specific interest in saying, hey, you know, I'm try just trying to recruit you. And what I did was simply just walk around La Pulga and other areas in Philadelphia and just said, hey, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a student at Duke. Uh, I'm doing work on understanding uh, the racial attitudes and politics of Mexicans. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to increase the you know, number of studies about how Mexicans feel about different things and getting their opinions because there's not enough of, enough of it uh, in political science. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, it just quickly clicked for me that that was simply the easiest. People were like, oh, mijo, like, I'll help you. And that ended up, like, being so easy for people to to be willing. And many of them just was like, you don't need to pay me. Like, I'm happy to do this. Um, and so in terms of just the recruitment and people in my field, you know, there's some things that were helpful to understand, to communicate how I was sampling people, um, but ultimately it was just from a personal, honestly known experience that simply just talking to people as human beings was just the easiest way to actually get people to talk to me. Um, thank you, Miguel, gracias. Um, one of my questions is, did you uh, have the opportunity to, to talk to any Mexicans who were also of indigenous backgrounds? and what uh, their experience of discrimination was, where in Mexico or here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes and no. Um, none of my respondents said I identify as indigenous. Um, but many of them talked to me and told me about their experiences as being perceived as indigenous. And so I had one respondent who told me that, um, that she lived in El Campo and um, she ended up going to study in the city uh, for her college education. And she said that people would often call her, you know, this derogatory word, like they would call her pinche india. And that was something that people were, she was just like, wait a minute, like, I, I'm not India. The, the people in the mountains and who live out there are the indigenous people. And so um, I didn't have anyone who explicitly say, hey, I'm indigenous. And that's something I do recognize that is a shortcoming of my research. Um, and I also didn't have anyone who specifically identified as like Afro-Mexican. And so, um, but I still did get a lot of respondents who identified primarily as mestizo. And when they talked about experiences of discrimination, they often talked about how much of the discrimination they experienced was revolved around like anti-indigenous sentiment. Thank you, Miguel. Anybody else in the room? Well, thank you, Miguel. 
I'm also from Mexico, and I have like discussed these kind of topics with other people, usually like people that are in a different probably situation, like that come with uh, a job, like kind of white collar job. Has been really difficult, kind of even to to talk to them about this. Um, but I was wondering if you have like some information about people like kind of see themselves about discriminating other groups. You talk a little bit about the African Americans, but discriminating people from the kind of Latinos also, if they are aware or, or not. But whether or not they're aware that other Latinos are discriminating other Latinos. Yeah. Um, great question. Um, yes, I, I think most of the people who had this external shock that they didn't belong, in particular when we think about the context of Mexico, and my respondents, some of them said like they just felt like they they were not Mexican or Mexican enough in Mexico, or that people often perceive them as different from what mestizo is. And often these respondents had more uh, like indigenous features that made them feel different. I'm not sure if that answers the question. Or... Yeah, a little bit like just uh, thinking if, if they believe that in their kind of daily activities they have like also been uh, aware of the discrimination they do to other of their own people. Oh, they, that they do. Uh -huh. Oh, okay, that's a great question. Um, let me think. No, I, I would say no. Mo I, and I think it would be pretty difficult to have someone s admit that they <laughs> discriminate against their, their own people. Uh, but they always, most of them mentioned their, their own experiences of being discriminated by their own, their own Mexican uh, community. Um, yeah, that's it. Ocayo, <laughs> gracias. Uh, I was wondering if you can give us a little bit of the sense of your data set in terms of the, you know, the spatiotemporal kind of, of, of the people you are working with, right? Is we know that as migrants come from Mexico, the longer they stay, I mean, the more integrated they are, uh, the places they come from, uh, right, also shape a lot of what they are. Uh, vis-a-vis, -vis, right, uh, people that live in the country in Campo or people that live or that have just arrived, right, in, in which their language skills, et cetera, is, is really tough. I think uh, the Mexican consulate here in, in, in Raleigh has collected a number of, 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 of information about them as, as they are served, served this community that is a very large community that could also help you to have a sense of the amount of, of new versus old migrants uh, within the community. And, um, uh, because yes, there is an issue of uh, self-discrimination, auto-discrimination, and you know, the exercise of discrimination that comes from different, let's say, uh, skin color, casta kind of, of of experiences of, of Mexicans uh, through through the caste system that and was trying to, to be resolved by by the Vasconcelos uh, Raza Cosmica, mm. but just to get get a sense a little bit of, of your data set in terms of uh, spatial temporal yeah. access. Yeah, uh, gracias, Miguel. Um, so what I found is that the my interviewees often match the demographics of where they were coming from. So specifically, a lot of people who, um, so I, I had a lot of my respondents take a look at a, a skin color scale and I told them, hey, what's, what's the, what's skin, t what hand, I don't know if you've ever seen, seen this scale, but there's a hand and different uh, skin tones on it. And I had respondents respond like, okay, which one, you know, do you feel like your skin closely matches with? Uh, and at times, I also did it too. I'm like, and so I, I also was like, okay, where is there a difference in terms of perception of skin color and the one that I, at least in my subjective view, uh, that, that they, you know, I perceive them to be. Um, but to be more specific, I found that a lot of the folks who had more indigenous features were from the southern part of Mexico, Oaxaca, uh, 
a lot of those areas in the coastal area. And people, Mexicans who were with lighter skin often came from the northern uh, part of Mexico, whether that was Mexico City or just uh, areas close to the border. And so um, in terms of, of my respondents and, uh, and as part of my survey, they, they mapped up, mapped onto like just historically where different types of Mexicans kind of reside in Mexico. Um, in terms of timing, and, and this gets to your question again. Something that I'm still assessing is uh, what, like at what age do they immigrate to the U.S.? And so there's, uh, there's a variation there that I'm trying to ex further explore whether like, okay, if you come, and my stipulation was that like you had to immigrate to the U.S. by 18 years old. Like it was difficult for me to... I wanted Mexicans to have some type of experience in Mexico, some educational background, so I could actually see how this ideology is actually permeate, uh, being part of the racial discourse. Um, but I, what I found and what I showed uh, partly here is that a lot of the younger ones who came had the opportunity to actually get an education in the U.S. and actually learn through ethnic studies courses or uh, courses around racial inequality that really pushed them to think more critically about di racial dynamics within their, their own family. Um, people would mention like, well, you know, they called my cousin Prieto and that, you know, I, I would always see that they would always talk about like, you know, you need to marry into, you know, uh, a, a wider family or just one that's like gonna uh, uh, widen our community, right? Like, it, it, you know, there were discourses around that and they were critical of it. Um, and then other people who were just like, like, you know, there's jokes. Like we just said, you know, we call each other questions. Like we call it, I'm sorry, not questions, but terms like this, that are like what I said earlier about how, uh, you know, Indio can, it can be derogatory or, um, uh, or negra, like it, depending on the context in which it is used. Uh, and many of these older folks were just like, that's, they're just jokes. They're just, that's, and that's the theme, right? Like a lot of a lot of foundational ra racism is steeped in humor for me uh, Mexicans. And that's something I found like, you know, it, it's hitting under his cloak of humor. Like, you know, we're just playing around. Like we're just, we just make, used to make fun of his skin tone porque está prieto. And like, that's what, you know, what we do. It's not really racism. But what I found that many of those same individuals would often highlight experiences or have opinions that were, one could argue that like, okay, you wouldn't think that if it hadn't started as a joke or it, it came from somewhere, right? And so um, I don't know if that answers your question again, but yeah. So we do have one on, from online, it's from Sahim. Um, it says, thank you for sharing your, res your research with us today. I'm curious about your process of interview. How do you initially approach them and where were those interviews conducted? Do you prepare a list of questions beforehand? Okay, thank you, Sahim. Um, so, uh, to expand a little bit uh, what I mentioned earlier, um, I also just connected to one person, and that person we just got along, like um, Anita, for example, she was in the business of selling uh, like Tejano stuff, like hats, cowboy boots, and that was just like, you know, I'm from Texas. And so I was just like, hey, but like this looks really interesting. This is what, uh, you know, my family just wears like every day and, you know, tell me about the business. And we just like kind of like hit it off. We were just like, you know, nice to meet you. And um, from then on, I was just like, hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm a student. I'm interested in doing research. Can you give me some of your time? And they were, oh, oh, you know, overwhelmingly excited to be part of it. And so usually for Manita, I got one to two people. Like, for example, uh, Anita connected me with one or two of her friends, and one of them ended up being um, a uh, the owner of a, a quinceanera uh, boutique. Um, I don't know how to say quinceanera in, Spanish, in English. Uh, quinceanera, uh, and um, and she had a little small library behind her business, and so I ended up interviewing her. We were just like really nice, and she was like hey, Miguel, like, if you ever want to use this space to interview folks, feel free to. And so a lot of my interviews ended up being just at this little small local library in, in, in Durham. Um, and others took place in um, cafes, but 
cafes that had like private meeting spaces. And I would interview people there, um, and I would just give them, you know, as a grad student dissertating, like I had free time, so whatever worked best for them, uh, whatever time worked for for them, you know, it would just be meeting them up, wherever worked best. And did you have a set of questions, or did you just do it as a free conversation style? Uh, I had a set of questions, um, and so I, I had questions that talked about. I usually started with asking, like, hey, you know, tell me about your upbringing in Mexico. How was that like? Did you live in an urban, rural environment? And then I would talk about, like, hey, there's a lot of talk about racism in the U.S. What is that like in Mexico? And then that's when I would get quotes of, like, you know, some people were like, uh, I mean, that's, like, only a U.S. thing. That's only happens over there. Like, us, it's only about class. Like, we, there's a lot of class discrimination. But when I gauged more about, like, hey, you know, and, and one person, I was, uh, you know, one of my uh, ment- uh, advisors was like, just be upfront with them. Uh, like, show them a stat that shows that regardless of socioeconomic status, people with darker skin tend to face grave discrimination. And I did that with one person, and she was like, you know, I think that's just a very occurrence. Like, that's not, not something that actually is something that exists largely, right? And so I was also, as I progressed, I was just like, okay, let me push push them a little bit more and actually introduce information that kind of contradicts what their thinking was. And so, um, yeah. Thanks, Miguel. Great job. Good to see you. Same here. Um, I'm wondering, I, I'm not sure what the, the cultural profiles of people in, in Durham and, and Philadelphia that you, you interviewed are exactly, but whether or not you experienced a lot of significant variation from respondents who came from like multi-ethnic backgrounds. So mm-hmm. I, I know there's like a Jap- significant Japanese Mexican population or whether or not upon immigrating they were say like in a multi-ethnic relationship uh, for ethnicities where the say country of origin has a, a different history with like racialization, whether that's uh, say a Cuban and a Mexican or a Dominican and, and a Mexican or an Argentinian with a Mexican, right? Whether mm. those were um, things that might have influenced the response as well. Mm. That, uh, that's a great question. Um, I did have one respondent whose mother was Mexican and his father was French, uh, which was um, interesting. And so I just talked to him about like, okay, like how that happened. Um, and I can't recall the specifics of, of, of how that happened. Um, but I'm trying to remember, you know, off the top of my head, I can't mention specifically what variation I saw between, and that's not something I've like deeply dived into because universally across my respondents, uh, all respondents, none of them, for example, when I told them like, have you ever heard of the term mestizaje? And none of, most of them did not know what that term was, although they said things that reflected what mestizaje is. And that's what, how ideologies function, right? They just, there's not, there's not always something physical to kind of say this is mestizaje or colorblindness. And so I would say I need to do more of a deeper dive in the variation between Philadelphia and, and Durham. But from my initial analysis, it seems like uniform, uniformly, like most of them have very similar uh, experiences about how they conceptualize what race and racism is. We do have another one online. Um, We are more frequently talking about equity. Did you find differences between the perception men and women had? Mm. Yes, uh, and uh, one was particularly difficult. Uh, for one of my respondents, uh, she, she recounted experience where she experienced, experienced gender violence. Um, and by specifically, she recalled like, oh, it was because it was an African-American man who like basically sexually assaulted her. And there were differences on other respondents between women and men that were like not only racialized violence but also gendered violence among women specifically. Um, but what was interesting about her case, she, at least for her who had more like indigenous features, she was like, 
you know, I had this horrible experience, but I don't think all black people are like this. Like I, and that was, a, you know, something that was, was positive that she was able to at least know, like, you know, I know how I've been treated in Mexico and differently. I'm not going to apply that same type of logic or kind of make this experience as a blanket um, categorization of African-Americans in the U.S. Well, I, because the, you know, it goes longer sometimes. So, do you have time for another <laughs> yeah, one at least? Okay, go ahead, <laughs> Thanks, Miguel. Um, to the pol your results of, about politics, yeah. uh, if you don't mind, if we could just pull that one up. I'm just, um, and this could have been outside the scope of your question or your research project in general, but I'm really interested in Anita, how um, open she was with you, and just wondering if that her sentiment about I want my business to be better if if you had time or was there space to actually delve into what that meant for her like what are mm -hmm. I'm thinking what are the policies or regulations that she's experiencing right now as a small business owner that makes her feel that are oppressive perhaps if that's the word and could she be and again I don't know if this was totally outside the scope of your conversation with her or were there specifics that she could point to that are connected in her mind to Trump and what he's portraying as what he can do differently that would make her business better? Yeah, uh, that's a really good, a good question. Um, from what I recall, she, she would mostly recall like uh, taxes and she said that, and, and this is true in political science, Republicans are often associated with like lower taxes, more business friendly, um, and so I think it was a combination of this association between Republican and better for businesses, and also her understanding that, hey, I got a business run. I feel under, Republic, uh, under, under Republican presidential uh, presidents that my taxes and my businesses are a lot better off than under a Democrat one. Um, and so um, what was interesting about her, uh, which was, uh, funny was like she said, I know you may feel weird about me voting for him. I was just trying to hold it in, just just like, you know, it's okay. Just as a researcher, I was like, I'm just trying to understand why, you know? Uh, and a lot of their explanations just for them is logical in the sense that like, hey, I want the best for me and my family. I'm going to vote for the candidate that for me in my situation as a business owner, I feel is better. And she was, she was also uh, a light-skinned Mexican, and she didn't really believe racism existed. So for her, a situation where, hey, do I want a political party that addresses racism and discrimination, or do I want one that's more applicable to me and that I want envi a political environment that's more better for my, my business? Yeah. And then she expressed positive attitudes about it. So I think this uh, question might have a short answer, so I'm going to quickly ask it. Um, thanks for putting this presentation together. In your research, did you find any common denominator or denominators on why some Latinx Mexican population align or feel attracted with white nationalism ideology? Mm, or attracted question. by, excuse me, they... Oh, that's, uh, that's, that's a really good question. Um, not from my interviews. I will say that broadly research, some research has shown that Mexican Americans who have been here longer tend to want to disassociate themselves from more recently arrived Mexicans because they feel the more recently arrived Mexicans kind of put a bad name to them. And so they often feel like, well, I'm going to support more restrictive uh, immigration policies because I'm not one of those Mexicans. And so I think that's an indication why some may be more um, attracted to some of these white supremacists. The follow-up was, did your research include second-generation participants? No. It was uh, just first-gen Mexican immigrants. Thank you. I do want to give you a round of applause and thank you for being here today. Thank you.